Oh, do you want to yeah. read it? Like, really? yeah. So we were just. Here, let's re roll. I screwed up. All right, everybody, we are over at Timber HP with my good buddy Mike from Greenside Design. He's still my friend even after we spent a week together in Switzerland. So that's, that's saying something about both of us, right? And Dan Edelman from Timber HP. So Mike especially wanted to, to film here. What is it about Timber HP that was interesting? Well, it's a new product here in the US, which caught my eye. I'm always trying to selfishly stay ahead of my competitors in my market. And this caught my eye at first because of the sound attenuation properties. It is basically better than another type of installation, I won't mention the name, and uh, I'm building a recording studio in a basement, so I think this is gonna work out really well. Uh, I also like it that it has a high R, high R value without a high price. What is the R value? So the bat is gonna be about a four per inch. Four per, okay. Yeah, the blow one's about a 3.8 per inch, and so is the board. Okay, Yeah. interesting. And some people might wonder, well, it's wood. Is it gonna catch fire? Is it is it um, gonna soak up moisture? I think, Dan, you can kind of answer yeah, those questions. definitely. So bring it all the way back to the wood chips. So we're actually taking the wood chips, the spent lumber, basically from the lumber mills up in the state of Maine. So we're based in Madison, Maine. So we're taking this, this was going to the paper mills. There were 18 paper mills in the state of Maine. There's two now. Oh, wow. So there's a lot of this just like going to landfills, yeah. getting burned carbon basically that it's storing for the entire life of the tree now is going back into the environment. By us making a product out of it, it's actually locking in that carbon into your house for hundreds yeah. of years. So what we do, we actually take this, we wet it, we shred it, and we add a liquid borate. The liquid borate does give the fire rating. So it is a class A, ASTM E84, class A rated product. You would do the same exact assembly as you would with like a mineral wool or fiberglass to hit your one hour or two hour fire rating. So, and we'll have, like yeah, and it smells like wood. <laughs> um, so it's about, I mean, 99% wood. The rest is just uh, liquid borate. And then we do add a bi-component uh, uh, binder to it. And that just holds it all together. So it is a polyester base. We're actually taking the suits from the 70s and we're recycling those. Not really, it's actually- I was gonna say, he's got a closet full of them if you need more. Yeah. But it's gonna be about 2% of that binder. So it's very minimal. Most of it is just wood. We have a loose fill product as well. Um, this is kind of what the starting point is before the binder even goes in. And this is gonna be priced at similar to like a cellulose um, and even some markets based on shipping cost. <clears throat> it's gonna be actually less than even like a blow-in fiberglass. Which is fantastic. Interesting. And yeah. so it does come in bat material, so the install wouldn't be out of the norm for a normal insulator. You just install the bats in the ball cavity, yeah. and then you have the blow-in that would blow in just like any other blow-in. Exactly, yeah. Same machine as you would use with a cellulose. Um, so pretty much two plugs is our rule. One plug for the, ag the air or the agitator. The other plug is for the blower. So, but with the bats, uh, even like PPE, we recommend only a dust mask okay. for the sawdust uh, and eye protection, but you don't need to wear long gloves nice. or, or long sleeves or gloves because nice. it's not irritating. Yeah. So you could work with this. Well, I mean, we just had Wade here from WKP and his son yeah. cutting this stuff and playing with it. I didn't even realize nobody's wearing gloves or, yeah. you know, they're not like Tyvek suit duct taped <laughs> to head in. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Do you wear gloves and long sleeves every time that you work with your, your framing? No. Uh, gloves in the winter. Well, but, right. But because then summertime, cold. yeah. Yeah. But then summertime, no. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, some of the other benefits because of the density is the sound. 
So it basically is going to exceed any other insulation material out there. It's really just the density and mass that really helps with sound. Right? I mean, you'd think I would know what yeah. I'm doing. All right, I'm with Dan, who brewed a special beer. But we're going to go through the, uh, what, what do we call this? The timber tunnel. The timber tunnel. So it's nice and loud out here. You can already feel it getting quieter. And now... Well, this is the place to come and have a real conversation. It is. Yeah. yeah. And then we come right back out. Now? Yeah. Take I'll be nap. back to take a nap. There we go. And the cross-directional fibers will lock any kind of sound or thermal. So it's also going to help a little bit with air tightness. You know, it's not your end-all be-all right, for right. air tightness, but it's going to help. We've yeah. done a couple dense pack jobs um, in a house and the same house we did with fiberglass and the they tested before, we actually were able to lower the blower door testing okay. with the dense pack. Oh, wow. Yeah. I guess the only other question I have, is this just a brand new product that's, you know, it's never been in North America? Has it been anywhere else? How do we know it's gonna work? Good question. 10 years from now, are we all gonna be really upset? Yeah, no, so it's been in the European market now for 30 years. Okay. It's a billion dollar industry over there, and 24% of their homes are built out of CMU, so their concrete masonry units. Whereas in the U.S., 99% of all homes are actually built out of lumber. So it fits the, the, the single-family housing market, multifamily housing market, way better than it does in Europe. Okay. But there's 30 years plus in So Europe. it's got a proven track record. Yeah. Exactly. It's just yeah. new to us. And as we talk about new energy codes and exterior insulation, is it true that down the down the pipeline you have an exterior insulation yeah. fiberboard coming out? And actually, can I show you guys the exterior insulation? If yeah. Well, if we walk over there? Yeah. Yeah. Come come with us, Greg. You dropped your top part, should I want to always Yeah, we have it right here. So over here, what we have, we have our continuous, it's called timber board. Okay. This is going to be a very rigid insulation. One of the biggest benefits is the fact that it's vapor permeable or vapor open over a 10 perm rating. Uh, so basically what that means is your house is able to dry. So houses don't want to breathe, but they need to dry. Right. We just took a, uh, sat through Dr. Joe Steenbrick talking about that. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Joe's right over there in I know, booth. I was like... <laughs> But yeah, so we're gonna start with a square edge. So this is just a square edge, you'll butt the joints together. You could put your WRB in front of it or behind it. Okay. Your air barrier can go anywhere in the system. Again, vapor permeable, vapor open systems, you could really mess around with that. Okay. Um, then we're gonna have a tongue and groove board. This is gonna be available in uh, January of 2025. And that's nice because it's actually going to be like a tight fitting yeah. board that will actually be airtight. We saw that in Switzerland, right? Weren't yes. they at very, the one very similar? Yeah. Again, what's the R value on this panel? So this is a 3.8 per inch. 3.8. Yeah, it'll fluctuate depending on the thickness of the board. We're going to be producing from one inch all the way up to nine inches thick. Okay. So. So I think I, in, in my climate zone, I have R5 continuous exterior. Yeah. So continuous. inch and a half. Inch and a half. Which okay. is also nice if you're doing an Audi window. Uh, where you basically just buck out the window with yeah. a two by four. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Awesome. Yeah. So everybody, look them up, Timber HP. And uh, go follow Greenside Design on Instagram, YouTube. Yeah, seriously, Mike builds beautiful homes in Chicago. And he's a half decent guy on top of it. So it's all an act. And the podcast. What's your right. podcast? The Level Heads Podcast. The Level Heads Podcast. There's at least one episode that's not worth listening to, the rest of them are outstanding. So, thanks guys. Thank you. Hey, nice shirt by the way. Oh man, we're twinning. I should have worn my jeans. Yeah. Yeah, this is gonna be cool. All right, everybody, look who I ran into. Hey, What's Steve up? Basic Architect. Steve Basic Architect. Yeah, we're at Harvest Homes. So Steve, you just did a project with it. We just did a project. So they're an off-site panelization we actually have our project being highlighted on the TV right there. Nice. But they're an off-site panelization company. They did our floor system, our wall system, and all of our roof trusses. They did all the engineering, and they built it all in-house. They probably have about 150, 200-mile radius. We're probably about 120 miles away from their factory. And you can see, I mean, everything is stored inside. Yeah. So, and then they put the project together basically, and they do all the engineering on it. 
thing that I really enjoyed working with them on is, unlike some panelization companies that say, well, we can only do this or that, or maybe this, these guys just said, what do you want to do? Right, so we did a two by six wall, 24 inch on center with Zip R9. Okay. And so they just went ahead and acquired all of the necessary materials and then they built the walls to our spec. So it's not like they had a recipe. And they ship it out to you, who assembles it? They have their own assembly okay. teams. So their trucks have their own articulated cranes. Yep. So we don't have to hire a separate crane. Um, the floor system, they did the floor system. We used the Triforce trimmable open web truss. Yep. Um, and the thing that I was absolutely amazed at, they said four hours, it was about three and a half hours to do 3,300 square feet of floor. I'm fast. I am not that fast. Yeah. Now, <laughs> there's the hours of building it yeah, yeah. in the factory, obviously, and then stacking it on the truck. But the beauty is we did a superior wall foundation. So while we were putting in the foundation the week before, simultaneously, the house was getting framed. Yeah. Right? So you're talking on site, probably about two weeks to go from dirt to a fully sheathed roof. So set walls, brace them, they drop the floor on. Drop the floor on. And immediately start setting walls? The walls came like the next day on another truck. Nice. And they came out and the framers put that together and when they were done with the walls, next truck came out and had a load of trusses. Yeah. So I got no problem with that as a 46 year old aging framer yeah, prefab is, I think prefab has got to be the way to go because we can't keep up with demand in Washington State. Yeah. But house prices are high, interest rates are high, but we need housing. And, you know, like I said, I've been to their factory too. You know, all the stuff is stored inside. There's nothing getting damaged there because they're, they're literally buying tractor trailer loads of studs. Yeah. And then they move it around with a forklift in their factory and they have, you know, one team over there making headers, one team over here framing the walls. And then they just keep inserting these pieces. By the time it's all said and done, how much more is that than everything being site built? 5%, 10%? Yeah, it's probably, it, it might even be a little bit more than that. The beauty of this project was the homeowner was acting as the general contractor. Okay. So he saved the money in the GC fees, yep. but in turn, by hiring, say, Harvest Homes, the whole framing package was taken care of. Yeah. Right? He didn't have to hire a framer. He didn't have to go and place the order for lumber and pay the lumber yard. He wrote one check yeah. to Harvest Homes, and they walked away with a framed house. Yeah. Nice. You know, all the window openings, we gave them the spec. They did all the pocket headers, everything exactly the way we would have done it. So you it. didn't really have a trade-off. You know how it is sometimes for, if we want to be maybe energy efficient or use some details that we can stick build, yeah. that maybe a prefab shop can't do, Yeah. that you didn't have to basically step back from any of that. No, not at all. And probably the, the biggest thing that, like if we were to do it again, the one thing we might look a little closer at is there were a bunch of meeting panels where we had like four or five studs sometimes. And yeah. it's like, maybe we just pay a little closer attention to some of those areas. Um, some of them, it made sense because it was, you know, big window or taller wall, but there were some areas I was like, wow, it looked like we were putting wood in for the sake what of putting wood What size do the walls in. come out, like lengthwise? Um, well, they have a 45 foot trailer. Oh, okay. So, and again, their own crane and you yeah. know, the walls really aren't that heavy. Um, and what was cool is they even work in efficient manner. So they didn't pick the walls one by one. They picked the walls in groups of like six or eight, especially the interior walls. They brought them over. Oh, they did interior and just set too. them. Yeah. And okay. then they just set them and then they just slid them around and nailed them into place. Well, I, as a framer, I like that idea of being upright and assembling. And just yeah. sliding the wall. Yeah. There's no lifting. And, you, you know, you talk about age, but there's also the factor, safety factor, right? Yeah, we're using a crane and we're lifting this, but, you know, there's also standing up walls, guys falling off the foundation or just hurting yep. your back, hurting your knees. This crane's doing all the work. Yeah. It's designed to do it. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Exactly. Anything else? No, I mean, these guys, you know, like I said, I... I keep telling them they should franchise and go across the country because, you know, I've had the same conversation with Jake and he's like, I wish we had somebody like that yeah. down by us. Yeah. Um, well, hey, we uh, Harvest Homes, I know some guys in Washington that would be interested <laughs> in using you. So there yeah. you have it. Awesome. But it, it, was a, it was definitely a positive experience. Um, if you're within, say, 150, 200 miles of Albany, New York, give these guys a call.
What would it cost to get it transported to Washington, like 2,000 miles? Yeah, we'd have to talk to them about that. <laughs> oh, man. Awesome. So uh, where can people follow you? People can follow me. I'm everywhere. You, Steve's everywhere. You'll find me on the Build Show. We have actually a ton of videos where we were flying in the floor system, and we talked about it. I have a couple of videos that I did, two-part series where we actually went to their shop yeah. and walked through it, which well, was like... I, I must not have gotten the email. I would have been there. Gentleman Lance, yeah. so you could have. Mark Willie was there. Well, <laughs> I'll take Mark's place next time. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, and of course, you can find me on Instagram. Pretty much type in Steve Basic Architect in Google. Follow along. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, baby. Follow along. Okay. Okay. Whew, man, I'm just like, my mouth's not working. All right, everybody, we are in Massachusetts visiting Ben's personal house. He reached out and said, hey, you're on the East Coast, why don't you swing by? So we did. So this is Ben. Tell us where we're at and tell us a little bit about the property and the house. Yeah, so this is Somerset, Mass. We're in South Coast, Mass. Um, this is my family's property. I grew up here, and now we've been planning this for about five years now, and here we are. Nice. Why'd you fix it, system? Uh, it's just a great product all around. Uh, you know, ease of install, be weather tight, pretty much right out the gate. So, yeah, couldn't go wrong with the Huber products. Um, okay, so we're going to go inside because it's freezing cold out here. Um, before we do that, why don't you plug Beacon Solar? Oh, yeah. I work for Beacon Solar. I'm the operations manager there. I've been there about 10 years. Uh, we take care of pretty much all your renewable needs on a residential and commercial level. So, yeah, just look us up, uh, www at beaconsolarma.com for any of your solar or battery storage needs. Nice. Now we'll make sure we put that in the description below. So since the windshield factor is minus 100, we are going inside. So we had beautiful weather in Rhode Island, but it was cold. It was like 28 degrees and very windy. Anyway, getting inside the house, you notice there were some hold downs on that other wall. I'll show you that up above. This is the basement. So lots of big steel beams. We almost never do steel beams uh, here in Washington. Extremely rare, unless it's a really big house. I think one time have I ever worked with red iron. Anyway, just a beautiful home. What a great spot, nice family place. So there's a look at the steel beam, then it's supporting the upper floor load. And of course that traces all the way down through the basement as you just saw. Nice, big, open room. One thing you notice is that they strap their ceilings on the East Coast, or at least in some states on the East Coast. We don't do that. I think nobody does that west of the Mississippi. People that do it swear by it. Those of us that don't do it don't see the reason. <laughs> it's just one of those differences between the east and west coast. Another difference, notice the hold down in the corner. These shear walls are there because of high wind. They sheath horizontally and then they block all the panel edges. And you can see the nails poking through the blocking there. That is a very good thing. You want to block your panel edges. Then you get the full lateral restraint, that rigidity that comes from the wood structural panels. That's what's gonna keep your house from racking. Say another big difference between East Coast and West Coast is a lot more houses are hand cut roofs like this one. The framers did a nice job, but notice the size of those ridge beams. So this I think was a three story house total plus the attic. So I'll just show you real quick in the attic, those um, duct the ducting hasn't been boxed in yet, but just frankly, as a framer, I've just gotta show off some pictures of the roof framing. So the framers did a really nice job, very clean. Again, notice the big LVLs and some hardware. I think I'd like to go back and visit this house once it's all finished. Really nice spot. I mean, look at those blue skies. What a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, no need for house wrap, weatherproof ability. It's, it's just a solid product in yeah. every way. You're all dried in. Yeah. So we are gonna go inside the house because we're freezing. The windshield factor has gotta be like minus a thousand and we don't want Greg to get hit by the uh, garbage truck that's backing up. <laughs> so let's head inside the house. Yeah, I like Looks good enough? Yeah. Like, or as good. All right, everybody, we're still here at Timber HP with Mr. Steve Basic Architect and Dr. Joe Stebrick. 
So this is a real treat for me because I get to work with Christy periodically. So that's awesome. So first of all, who are you guys? Well, I, I was just I was just wandering around and uh, I was a homeless guy and. Uh, and Steve adopted me. Oh, nice. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so you guys knew each other for a long Joe time. Joe had a little knowledge, and he shared it, and so now I share it. And, and Steve pretends that he, he yeah. that it's his. Oh, we, we, we met each other, my God, in 95? Yeah, 90, it's right around there. Yeah, right 90, around there. 90, 90, I, I remember vividly coming. I, we, I talked to Betsy on the phone. She said, Joe's going to be home. Because Joe used to fly, like, he spent more time on airplanes yeah. than he did home. But he said, Joe's going to be here this weekend. Can you come in tomorrow morning and meet with him? And we sat down on the couch, and they hired me right there. And then uh, Steve was responsible for us having to sell our house and move because he couldn't stand up in the basement where our office was. So we ended up getting a, a house with a room that Steve could stand up in. <laughs> so I have a question for Dr. Joe. With everybody getting focused, like building codes on building science, and like watch, I was telling him, in Washington we're going continuous insulation, all these big changes, people are freaking out. How does somebody go about just even getting a start in understanding building science? Well, okay, I'm going to say something that sounds like I'm going to be sucking up the Journal of Light Construction, but sign up to JLC. It's a great, great publication. And then uh, go to our website and read, you know, Building Science Insights. There are 150 of them. Yeah. And then buy all of the books from the old people that actually that actually wrote them. And, and it's going to take you a while. but. The, I learned by reading the Canadian Building Digest, and there are 250 of them. And I, I would read, you know, one one a week, and then I moved it up to two a week, and and it was a it was a, it was a big deal. Yeah. So the Canadian Building Digest were where I started, but they they stopped writing them 1970, and I, I my my building science insights are based on the Canadian Building Digest because the old old timers basically inspired me and so and, and none of it is behind a paywall because all of the stuff I learned from the old guys it's my responsibility to give away before I die right because yeah. when you're dead it's kind of hard to communicate with the architect <laughs> you know I, I tell everybody I, I, I certainly learn a, a boatload about building science from you but if people ask me what's the number one takeaway of having spent time with you I tell them it's the way that you treated information and that you always believed information wasn't yours to hold on to. It wasn't necessarily yours to give. It was you got information from old guys like Gus and Neil. You did your interpretation to it. You changed it. You made it the spirit of your time. And then you passed it on to people like me and awesome framers. And you've always talked about that. And I think that's probably the, the biggest asset, and it'll be my memory of you forever. Well, thank you for that, and, and I, we owe it to everybody to share the knowledge, right? I mean, I mean I, I'm mean, i tired of, well, you can't get at this because it's a secret or unless you hire us and whatever, and I'm, you know, here, here it is. And then, you know, if you you know, if you want to hire us, great. I'm trying to retire, I, you know, I, I, I send all of the request for work to all of the youngsters that are not... That's no what half the young. presenters here are doing. Yeah. You know, I started coming to the show in 2000, and they, Gary Katz, Mike Slo they were all my age that I am now. And they're older, they're still passing on knowledge, so I feel like it's incumbent on me to try to pass as much on, too. You, yeah. you asked about, what, it, what if I'm a young builder, how do I get started? I think it's start sharing some knowledge because even if you're a young builder and you're making mistakes, someone like one of us three is going to sit there and say, hey, maybe you want to rethink that yeah. detail and do this or do that. Here's some options. Yep. Or maybe we just say, yeah, damn, that's a really great detail. Keep doing that. But you don't know. And so many people are afraid to put that information out there. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other question I had for you, we get all this criticism from Europeans that build with block. Why are we building with sticks and wood? Like, so what are the big advantages to wood in North America? Well, it, it, it wood comes from trees. And I, I know some that's really stupid. Wood is good. Um, look what's happening. Wood is made from photosynthesis, right? We're basically taking carbon dioxide and water vapor from the atmosphere with energy from the sun. And so wood is storing energy from the sun. It's solar, solid solar heat. How could you not 
I, I had a lot of fun with uh, when I started burning a fire uh, in one of our fireplaces. You know, they said, "Well, you, you, you're burning wood," and I said, "Well, actually, it's solar heat," because they kind of freak out that, you know. And, and so, why would you want to take energy from the sun and you know basically use it to melt rocks to make brick? That's kind of yeah. kind of dumb, right? And and what's neat is that when we're done. Mother Nature recycles the wood back into carbon dioxide and water vapor and energy. I mean, what, what's what's not to like about it? I don't I don't understand Europe. First of all, they don't know how to play hockey. Yeah, and they have this you know problem with wood. Yeah, you know, but they do make good beer. That's true. Yeah, I, for us, you know, we're in Washington, so we're timber country, British Columbia, Oregon. And they, um, I read an APA thing that said that we actually have more timberland now than we did in the 50s. Yeah. Just yeah. As well and, and the 1800s, probably. Yeah, we had yeah. far more farmland and pasture land back then yeah. than we do now. Yeah. And, 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 and by the way, we don't have to cut down thousand-year-old trees to do this. Yeah. I mean, you know, oh my God, you know, you're taking apart the pristine forest. Well, no, we, we could grow them in the corn, corn fields of Ohio if necessary, yeah. right? I don't really, you know, it's really, what I view this is, is that it's the, it's the cellulose revolution. And we're going to get the cellulose from plants and trees and the energy from the sun. What's not to like about that? I guess it would just be as long as we design so it's resilient. Well, that's a big word that means don't do stupid shit. Oh, sorry, did I just swear? So my second favorite thing about Joe is he can take the most complex comment and just put it in the palm of your hand in a sentence, right? And it is, it, it, you know, you you always see, I mean, let's time to beat up on architects. Architects love to reinvent the wheel. Like I see some of these details and then it's like, oh, we're getting water trapped behind the insulation. We'll just drill some holes. No, you don't drill holes through the insulation to drain it. You develop a system that doesn't put water behind the insulation. Don't do stupid things. And then come up with stupider ideas to stall for the stupid things. Yeah, it's that line from the office where Dwight says, I think would an idiot do this? And if he would, then I do not do that thing. <laughs> just try not to be an idiot. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. It's an honor and a pleasure. Yeah. Always, a pleasure yeah. Always uh, yeah, a pleasure, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks, brother. JLC Live 2024. You learned into all of the celebrities. What's up, Tim Mueller? Nice to see you. It's only been like three weeks. It's only been a few weeks. So, Tim Mueller, awesome framers, publishing a YouTube, publishing every day on Instagram, an incredible yeah. framer. And his brother is Pioneer Builders that shoots videos on our network. But Tim, I know you're a big Simpson guy. Brian's the smart one, I'm the strong one. <laughs> yes, we are big Simpson guys. So yeah. I, first let's talk uh, pergolas. You know, I didn't realize that Simpson made all kinds of interesting pergola hardware, but I saw this on your Instagram feed. You made a bunch of uh, yeah. videos about this. Talk to me about their hardware. So obviously if it's Simpson, it's engineered, it's got its all its design values, Yep. but it it's not made for appearance. Right. So this is made for appearance, but what they've done is, if you've ever installed through bolts, what a hassle. Oh, they're hard. These seconds, and so it fits right in the, right in kind of the faux nut. Yep. And then what's pretty cool is see on the back side of that, that locks it in those holes. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, so you just preload these, gotcha. little three pound impact driver. And now we've got a structural connection that looks good. You should have been in marketing. I like the faux nut. I should have been in marketing, name. yeah. Man, that's really, that is cool. That's interesting that it indexes in. Yeah. And then this is their, uh, I forget which, what do they call these? I think that's the SDWS timber screw. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, we use these all the time and, and we're going to get them in black now, you know. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like that. And by the way, there's a bunch of other hardware so that you could really take lumberyard materials uh, and turn this into a really nice yeah. block. I've seen you use it, some of this hardware on decks. Do yeah. you have any? Yeah, it's all of our structural connection. So, post base and then we anchor everything with titan hds we've got our engineer said no more cast in place yep. lock our mud sill down we drill everything and after the fact with these never get a bolt in the wrong spot the concrete guys don't get a bolt in the wrong spot we're cutting it off drilling epoxy it's a little bit more money on the front end but by the time we save labor on the foundation and framing yeah it's pretty nice the other thing that i would tell you about those that i like is how many times i've done this a bunch maybe you guys haven't where you've put an anchor into a doorway yes you got to cut it off and you're it's like, hey, what happened? You're like, oh, it's no big deal. And they're like, what do you mean it's no big deal? Yeah. 
you know, you cut an anchor bolt off. Yep. I mean, I want to see a letter. I want to see, you know, why is it that you made that mistake? It just makes me look bad. Yeah. Even though it was a, you know, a random accident, it's no big deal. To we had an inspector, they're stamped on the head. So the inspector's like, well, how am I supposed to know the length? And I said, right on the head. Okay. If you want us to, we'll pull one out for you. Just pick one. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, really easy, idiot proof, yeah. which is what we need is awesome framers. I like it. Awesome framers needs to be idiot proof. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something else new from Simpson, if you don't know, they have a tool that allows you really to design the, your entire backyard from sheds, pergolas like we're standing in now, decks. They've got some really cool design tools. Yeah. We're going to be using Tim on a new project I've got coming up called the Reisinger Bowl. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to have a deck in the backyard and a shed using their tools. And Tim, this is our show house for Build Show Live. Have you heard about our show? I have. I plan on being there in November. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. I can't yeah. wait. Yeah. Guys, if you're not familiar with uh, Tim, go check out Awesome Framers on Instagram and his YouTube channel. He's an incredible framer. And the thing I like about you and your brother in particular is that you guys are so great at teaching. Trying to, yeah. Passing down your yeah. Uh, generation builders. Their dad started, their mom and dad started the company. Yep. It's nice to see you. I'm sure we'll run into each other live. For sure. From the Simpson booth here at JLC Live 2024. Yep. You just rolled right into that like you knew you knew everything about this stuff. You know, we've done, we've both done this once before. Yeah. Thank you for being in that with me. Oh, yeah. No problem. Being in that with me. Oh, yeah. No problem. I am the training manager for the Southeast. Uh, that's based in McKinney, Texas. Anybody know where McKinney is? No. Oh. It's the north side of Dallas, Fort Worth. So... Uh, I'm out of there. I am in year 28 with Simpson Strong Tie. I started in the Carolinas. I have done everything from, from sales and multiple roles. So now I'm part of our training and engineering team supporting the Southeast. And I, I get to, I always like to define the Southeast because everybody says, oh, the Southeast, what's that? Well, you, you're going to love this. The Southeast, we call it as Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas. We cut across Tennessee. Coastal Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, back across the Gulf. And then it's Mexico, Central, South America, and the Caribbean. And everybody always goes, the Caribbean? And yes, I get to go to the Caribbean and teach classes and talk about building and framing and high winds and all this stuff. And everybody's like, you're lucky. And clearly they've never gone to the Caribbean for work because we fly out on a Monday morning and we fly back on a Friday night and it's, you know, six person planes hopping between the islands and the pilot says, hey, can you hold the stick for a minute? Well, I, and I'm like, no. So, but I'm uh, certainly glad you guys are here with us today. We've been teaching classes all throughout the day. We taught one this morning on footings. Um, we had Hollywood Dex with us for a while. Uh, Eddie Longshore with Culpepper. Eddie's in the back. I think you just talked about rot and decay and preserved and treated wood. And now we've got Tim with Awesome Framers here. And we're going to talk about the state of construction and a lot of stuff what's going on. So, Tim, thank you for being here today. I'll let you introduce everybody, yourself, and, and, and any of your crew you got here and, and tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm Tim from Awesome Framers, Instagram, YouTube, it's all that stuff. Volume. Oh, it's always too quiet. Okay, I'll try to use my outside they're, voice. They're going to they're gonna turn it up a little they'll bit. Turn it up I think. a little. My outside voice. So, I am 46. My dad started our company when I was about six months old. So we've self-performed framing, foundation, siding, whatever, you know, that's needed to be done. Single family residence. And then 2003, I started writing for the Journal of Light Construction, coming to JLC Live, meeting all my heroes like Mike Slogan over there and uh, Mike Gurdon. So now, after all these years, we've kind of carved out a little bit of a niche for ourselves, focusing on if we're going to do it, let's do it right. And we have done a lot of Simpson stuff wrong <laughs> and learned the hard way to do it right. And so that's kind of been a big focus is as people come into the trades, they don't go to schools necessarily here. They come to events like this and now they follow people on social media. That's how we learn. And so instead, of, we, we try to have some fun with it too. But show people how to do things safely. So show the quick stick, you know, just various things, fall protection. Try to get people to think. We used to make the joke that the best framers were weak minds and strong backs. But we can't be... Um, we can't be lackadaisical about things anymore. Everything's changed, and it's a lot more cerebral than it used to be. Absolutely. You see a lot of uh, change in the industry through the years. Like I said, I'm in, in year 28 in this industry with Simpson, and we watch the building codes evolve. We watch the materials that we build yeah. with evolve, and we've seen so much focus on energy codes. And a lot of this you know, so-called green building is, yes, they're trying to be more efficient and less materials and all of these things, and it often makes it challenging to make structures safe, strong, yeah. and, and deal with it. 
tell me some of the some of the early challenges you faced, and, and I love this this learn by doing, right? You're, you're talking about, hey, let's let's. What are some of the things that you do? You remember any, anything that sticks out? It's like, gosh, man, we did this, and then you learned a better way. Everything was an inch and a half Tico nail. Every piece of hardware was inch and a half. And now I even see on social media that's basically what a lot of people still do. No, you're, so you're right. It, it is longer fasteners. Understanding which ones go where. Um, we used to just read the side of the nail gun box. You realize that's not necessarily the actual size of the nail. So all the little things, you know, learning how to read the catalog, um, concrete mix design, where does rebar go? Our engineer is really good about working with us, and if I have a question, I can call him. Or when I do, like if I call him, generally his first comment is, you need to get out of jail free card. What did you do wrong this time? And so I just, you learn by doing, and unfortunately we kind of learn by doing wrong. Sure. So a, a little bit like when we first started coming to JLC, the old test with the uh, deck that would collapse. Right. Everybody run over to see what's going on. Nobody talk about decks collapse in the 80s, right? Or even early 90s. Right. So it's that kind of stuff that we've just, as an industry, progressed because we've started to realize what didn't work well. Right. So. No, I, I, absolutely, that's it. And we say it's kind of kind of funny. We here we are on Wednesday. Simpson had a virtual training summit. So I'm not sure if anybody was aware or went on. We had a. Almost 13,000 people sign up to take uh, one of 16 different courses that we offer throughout the day on Wednesday. And uh, oddly enough, I taught one on proper installation yeah. of connectors, and we probably spent 15 minutes talking about nails and screws and bolts and the right fasteners and everything that goes with it. Tell me, in this ever-changing world that we're in, what are some of the, the challenges you faced with with framing, and then some ways that you you know you work with your engineer, and maybe you go, you know what, we're going to do this this way every single time because it works and it's a better way. Yeah, we started working with Terry, Terry in 2006. So I don't know about you guys here, we're seismic design category D2. I can picture me. It's really hard to hear you. Really? Yeah, let me let me just pull it up a little bit. Sorry, I just, I had to- TV go. timeout. Anybody got a score on a basketball game? I, I need, I need my, my face powder. It is NCAA March Madness. I don't know. It's I need my face powder. powder. I'll try. Look at your face and talk louder. Okay, because it's like sounds like it's blaring to us. Now I know what Matt Damon feels like. Okay, there you go. No, not at all. That's louder. Okay, that's better. So the question. Do you remember your so, question? So I do remember the question. <laughs> We're back from TV timeout now. You know, what I was asking is, you know, you're working with an engineer, which which we found to be great, and we're looking for consistency in the way we build and the designs that they produce. You know, I was asking if there's some ways that some that used to be very challenging to you that you guys have found something that works and it's allowed you to make it repeatable in all your projects or the framing that you do uh, and, it, and it's successful all the way around because it's strong and and it's code official accepts it and stuff from there i would say on so maybe backstory 06 we started working with the engineer that we work with now super reasonable guy terry's like 81 or 82 mostly retired he's kept us on honestly because of the social media right he just enjoys watching that whole part of it so he's he's the guy that i can call and say if we install it that way, it's gonna be more difficult. Usually that's sequencing. So like if we drop a ridge beam onto a column, he might have a connector that we can't pre-install in a rake wall. And so it's things like that. But I would say that the quick stick and the structural screws have been like the biggest game changer in hardware for us. It's like the guy that works with me, Kyle posted yesterday, he had a detail where we had rafters that came down, fake rafters that came down to a beam to define the, the vaulted room. And we went ahead and beveled all the blocks to make the drywaller's life easier, which means I didn't put in the hanger he specified, but I knew I could ask for permission later. <laughs> and he doesn't take it personal. So I emailed him and I said, here's the reason why we did it. Basically, what, what, what's the fix gonna be? It was that screw gone right through the rafter into the beam. Right. And so Kyle posted a video yesterday with the quick stick. And I'm like, that would have taken way longer with even just a two by four hanger. Right. So it's the things like that that have, um, I think, improved it's improved on the labor side. It's not so hard. Right. And if it's not hard, we're much less we're much less likely to do a bad job. So the screws that we can double shear. I just hand nailed with 16s for the sake of video a couple weeks ago. And by the end, I was telling the guys, I was like, I've gotten so bad at hand nailing. <laughs> and so I went down to the lumber yard, $18 for a box of screws, and we did the second one. And when I posted it on Instagram, all of the comments were We've all switched to screws. 
in the old days it was, you know, I just spent $300 on a titanium hammer. I got to use it for everything. Right. Now, now it just looks really good in my bags. I'm going to just get an impact driver and screws. Yeah, I have one of those. It does look really it good, looks on, the, so good. On, on the belt. Yeah. I got a chromed out one just to <laughs> look how good this looks. It, it's, it's funny to tell you that we, we talk about trends and stuff that we see. Screws are becoming a bigger and bigger part of framing. And yeah, that connection we, we, for us. Yeah, easy. I mean, you're just grab a drill. You know, it, it, it's a little tedious at first to go, okay, how far from the edge do I need to be? Because we don't want them to cross, you know, and run into each other. Once you get that down, it's just so much easier on the labor side. Once the guys watch a couple of them, we, we print out the instructions. So it's just, the, the thing about hardware and earthquakes, like for us, or hurricanes, it's a life safety issue. So that, that lands on the framer. It is my job to install that hardware that the engineer specified, that we pay $200 an hour. It's his stamp. Now it's my job to make sure it's done right. So the easier the products are to install correctly, the more likely they're going to be correct. All right, so 100% spot on there. And you know, one of the things we see, you, you mentioned the quick stick, and I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with uh, quick stick or not, the products that he's talking about, but, but this is the tool, right? The actual part doing the work, I'll let you hold that a sec. Th yeah, this is, like, this like is what he's talking about. High. So this screw here is an alternate method than a hurricane tie. Yeah. And, and you know, Simpson sells millions and millions and millions of hurricane clips. And the way you install them is, guess what? Up a ladder with that $300 hammer or the $300 nailer that's and, and dragging the 200 feet of, of hose with you up the ladder and holding the clip in place and trying not to drop something and then running and nails into it. Or this product, and the key thing, what you said there, and I really love that, is if we can make it easier to install and ensure the quality of that install, now somebody can take a drill, put this on the end of it, you drop this in, and don't even have to go up the ladder and can attach that rafter to the top of the wall with, with one of these. Yeah, I can reach with the drill. I'm like 11 feet installed. Yeah. So how easy is that? Yeah, I mean, can't have a better solution for, for safety and more importantly, the quality and stuff of the installation. So, so love it. That's, that's great. Good well, to hear. And we've really tried to focus more on safety too over the last, I don't know, maybe like eight or nine years. I, I used to make the joke that I didn't fall, I've never fallen off a roof. How many guys here, framers, have fallen off the roof? Any, anybody falling off a roof here or we a ladder? Have one honest person. Two. Okay. Like we've slipped and had lots of like near misses like crazy, right? It was a badge of honor to run around up high. But I'm 46 now, and I look at the guys, and it's like, if you have kids, I'm going to be responsible if you can't go to home to your kids and play with them because you're injured. And that's a big deal. And so things like this, we're looking, okay, the best thing for us to do is eliminate a hazard. Ladders, there's a Turner Construction in Seattle, they have a no ladder policy. Because most injuries are falling off a ladder. They're not usually falls from 20 feet. Right. It's off ladders. It's under, it's under like 10 feet. Yeah, so, I, I've had one of those, I know. Yeah, the guy that taught me, you know, landed on his elbow when he was younger, and, and you carry that the rest of your life. So if there's a product that's easier for us to install, and it's safer, and, and we were talking yesterday, there's like a coolness factor the first time you use it. You're like, oh man, this is so much better than getting on a ladder, dragging hoses around. That goes away eventually. Pass it on to the next person. Right. It's great inside work. I mean, there's just no, um, none of our inspectors give us trouble. Our engineer, it's strong tie. So he's like, I calculated, I have all these ways to meet my design loads. Let the framers pick the one that's the easiest. Right, yeah, and I love that. And the, the, the screw there, the, the nice thing about it, and we, we have a lot of high wind markets in, in the Southeast, but around the, around the country, even here in the Northeast, you know, that screw grew in popularity. And like what often happens is people say, well, can I use it for this? Or you know what, I need, and even stronger, you know, normally we use an H10A and something, and then we'll go to that. And so now you can install two or even three of these screws to, to get that out of capacity. So since you're the smartest guy up here, how does it work that the, that the head is so small, it's fully threaded? I think most of us were taught we want something with a, with a larger head. Yeah, like the, um, like the timber screw. So how is this giving us equivalent or even slightly better? So, it's a great question, anybody know? besides Rachel and, and Scott. Here's the man, I'll trade you. I, I'm gonna give you that one, I'm gonna take this one. So you, you said the reason why, it's, it, it's the fully threaded screw. So if you install this, this is a six inch screw, 
the, the easiest application is if we had a, the bottom cord of a truss sitting on top of the wall. So I'm going to run this screw up from that through that bottom plate, uh, or through the, the top plate. The double top plate is how thick? Three inches, right? So that means three inches of thread are into the wall, and three inches are into the that bottom cord of that truss or what rafter or whatever it would be. That's what's doing the work is the thread. You don't have to have the, the bearing. A lot of times you'll see a fastener that's not fully threaded. And in that case, you 100% would need like the extra head and stuff that's on it. And that's what you see in these. This is the SDWS. This is the exterior rated version, which you pointed out is very commonly used on decks and outdoor construction. Uh, we have a, a one with a, just a black uh, finish for interior. So LVL beam, somebody's got a two ply, three ply, four ply beam. They're rated to do that, and it's it's not fully threaded because it's by design. Because now you don't have the plies jack. You probably you guys have probably run screws and you know three ply LBL, and you, you get through the first ply. He's nodding his head. He's done it, and the board lifts up like that. And if you're not careful, you pinch your finger. Mm -hmm. um, but those screws are designed to to go through that, and then that's when you get the clamping. So now the thread. It, it, that's in the bottom ply is clamping down with the head on the front. So you're telling me design went into this. It's thought out. A hundred percent design went into it. And I, I tell you what, there's a new version of this coming. I've seen it. You, 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 it's going to be pretty cool. You're, you're going you're gonna to love it when you see it. And it's exterior rated. So okay. that's the one thing that we ask is everybody wants to use these out here on decks and gazebos and pergolas and things of that sort. But it, this one's not rated for it, but this new one is. So... But I've used them outside. Oops. It was the black ones, right? That, that was... Sure. <laughs> Learn by doing wrong. <laughs> that's that's Austin Framers t-shirts next year. Austin Framers, we learn by doing wrong. Simpson Strong Tie. <laughs> right? So let's uh, let's talk about some other things. We're talking about trends we see. A uh, couple of the things that I notice, and we seem to get more and more calls about our lateral bracing. And it doesn't matter if we're in high seismic areas or not. Um, trends in the home are they want all these windows and open spaces and open rooms and everything. So how, th then they ask, well, how can I address my bracing? And I go, well, that window or those eight windows aren't going to help you. So, so what are you guys seeing? What are you guys doing for your bracing? Generally, we can get away with just wood structural panels, straps, hold downs. Mm -hmm. We had one plan that there just was not enough internal shear walls. And so we actually cast in place the portal walls garage header. We had never done it. Like we do our own foundations. We are not foundation people. <laughs> we can do it. We do it sometimes well. So that was all new. Uh, interior concrete wall full height for the hold downs. Double mat of steel for hold downs. And then on top of those portal walls, we had the, the strong wall, the LSL wall anchored. I have pictures of us. We uh, fasten two by and straps because they're not light, right? Right. Second story, booming it up, locking it down. So that typically for us, it would be that. Very rarely, unless we went all windows, would we go moment frame? Right. So, and you can see a lot of things he mentioned there are good. The, the code gives us some provisions for site build options, right? The, the, standard, the standard in the code is the four foot piece of wood structural panel sheathing that, that, that's an OSB or a plywood. That's the standard, the four by eight. Uh, works up to 10 feet. If you go a little taller walls, you got to get a little wider. But there's a lot of plans that don't have that, especially if you look at a wall line. Uh, even in non-seismic non areas, you might still need 12 to, to 16 feet of bracing, and a lot of times you won't have it in four-foot chunks. So the code gives us options to go narrower, and some of them are like what you said, oh, it's standard plywood wall, a couple hold downs, maybe get down to as little as 16 inches. Uh, there's some cases where it still doesn't work, and that's where, you know, I mentioned some of the prefab panels, and, and we've got a slew of solutions. We've got walls made out of steel, walls made out of wood uh, that are filled trimmable uh, based on the height that you need. And that's what we did, is we put them in full height, whatever I ordered them, nine feet, right. built the walls to the side, drew a line, cut them in. I think I have a picture of Kyle cutting them in place. And you can go up to like 18 feet, 20 feet, whatever yeah, they 20, are. 20, 20 plus feet for them on it. And so that's that's per exactly what you said is the way they're meant to be used. These ones that are feel trimmable and it makes it easy because, you know, you, you get on some projects and this wall might be 10 feet and this wall might be 12. And, you know, you're worried you can just order all the for the tallest wall and then cut what's needed on, on site instead of getting them confused. What, one other area where I see a lot of... Uh, issues and people asking questions how to do stuff are tall walls. I don't know if you guys do, you know, we get these great rooms that are 20 feet tall and, you know, you, the code is not very clear at how you build these. And, and you, you mentioned you're working with an engineer. I love that. 
a lot of people don't want to do that. And yeah. so they're, 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 they got to build these 20 foot tall wall. And it's kind of scary when I go on the job sites and look at it. How do you guys handle your taller walls? We're actually going to start this week another house. We're balloon framing. So we might partner with Roseburg because they've got LVL studs, which are very expensive. We don't want to use them everywhere. We won't even use them on cabinet walls because I can straighten a cabinet wall pretty sure. cheaply. But for tall walls that need to be stiff while we lift, LVL. Yeah. And, and that's a good way to do it from the framing, from the axial purpose. But, but it runs us into another problem. And, and that's where if we look for the bracing, that lateral support system, there's nothing in the building code that's taller than 12 feet. And, you know, so I've got a 20 foot wall, if I got to put bracing in it, the only option is to go, you know, either the engineer's got to call out something, which is going to have its own limitations and design, or those prefab walls that we have. So you take those field trimmable ones, 20 feet tall, it shows up on the job site. If you need it at 19, six, yeah. six inch cut, stands into place, you've got your bracing for what would count as two stories. Through the other here. thing, I didn't see it here. Do you guys have any CSHP strap here? No, we do not have any, any cool strap here. How many people have used a standard nail gun to nail straps? Oh, that's great. Nobody here. No, nobody's ever nobody here would ever strap. do that. A lot of people will just take their pneumatic nailer and nail straps, right? But Simpson has a strap that we can do that with. And it's the CSHP strap. And we use that for everything. Our engineer walked through me with me one day. Again, get out of jail free card. We had changed something and he needed to sign off for the county. And as he went through, I was like, point out everything you notice and, and teach me so I understand the principles better. And he's like, anytime you have two separate elements, like if we build a rake wall, it's a gable, and we join a standard height wall to it, then we want to strap the plates to the block line so that they act together. Right. Same thing if we have a window and a shear wall, we're strapping tops and bottoms. We're just taking that strap. So it, it made it a lot easier to start to understand load path mm -hmm. and be like, okay, that beam is sitting on a wall. How do I positively connect it to the wall? A lot of times I can just get him to tell me a minimum length. We cut it, nail it off with the same nailers that we're already using. So it's that kind of thing. I wish that there was a good way to, as framers, be able to interface with the engineers because I think they want us to give them feedback. It's not just that they're giving us these details that, and, and clearly they've never been on a job site attitude, but they want to make our life easier. And the, I think I have a question for Strong Tie, maybe for the audience. How does Strong Tide come up with their their connectors, fasteners, load tables? Like, what's the gen? Like, why are you why are you creating a guard post that that meets a certain design with screws? Like, what's the point of that? So, great question. Do you guys ever wonder that? Why that that book over there is over three hundred pages? It just keeps getting bigger. Stuff, why? Right? Maybe that's the simple question. Right. And, and the reason being, it's people like you, right? I, I get it. I think steel metal connectors are beautiful. I love seeing them all over everything. My wife and my kids love seeing them everywhere. Stuff with it. But the reality is, it is a cost to the structure. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a couple different reasons you'll see those. Uh, one is it's in the code. The code says, hey, you need this, and we've got to solve a problem uh, that's there for the code. Uh, another way is somebody's just fabricating something up. And then the other way is that, that feedback. We want to have that relationship with framers and contractors in general and with the engineers and they call us up and they say hey I want to put this post on the inside here and I need a better way to do it because my guys keep messing up with the hardware and the drilling and they over drill and so we okay we come up with a detail with blocking and screws both of which are on the job site and, and it solves the issue or it's an engineer saying this is my struggle, right? Finding, uh, we, we were talking just a minute ago about shear walls, and we have wood walls that are prefabbed, and we have steel walls that are prefab. The feedback kept coming, look, those are hard to handle on the job site. We gotta have a, a skid steer or, or a tractor or something to move them around. And they wanted something they could assemble on site. So we came up with the PFS, the portal frame system, and it's kind of a box of parts. You get this box, and it's got a couple of hold downs and a couple of bases and a whole bunch of screws. And you can take LVL, which is on the job site already, and you can laminate a column and your beam and put the straps on it, and all of a sudden you've got a, a shear wall type system that you built on site that's less money than you know, bringing a $500 prefabricated wall in. So uh, the, to answer your question, all of that happens because somebody's saying, hey, I need a better way to do this, and or, or the code provisions change. And th those are things that, that we see a lot. Do you guys, do you guys ever do much with, with trusses and uh, 
We're mostly hand cut. Mostly hand cut everything. I feel the type of work you guys are doing. What, one of the things we've got a display over here on this table that, that you guys should look at. That's, that's the perfect example of what happened. So this is uh, we're showing you guys on this side. You can see there are truss clips there, and those are slotted. So when we have a truss that passes over an interior non-bearing wall, that truss is meant to be able to move up and down slightly, as, as depending on the weight on the roof, weather conditions. And oftentimes, people, we've got a nice clip, they install it there, they put the nail in, they nail it too tight, and it pinches it. And now, all of a sudden, engineering-wise, we're transferring load to a wall that wasn't made to carry it. We get problem with movements in, in the ceiling and everything. Um, so we've got a product for it, which kept getting to that point, misinstalled. Yeah. And then we come up with a screw system that goes into place. So you guys can go over there and look at those and move, tap on them. They move up and down, and you'll see exactly uh, w what it's meant to do. It still has works out of plane this way so we can keep the wall in place, but we're not turning it into a structural bearing element. So that's a, that's another good thing that, that happens there. Um, such framing instead of structures, you guys doing much work outside? Any you know outdoor projects, decks, pergolas, gazebos? We've got two decks going right now. We um, In the Pacific Northwest, if possible, we try to pour concrete. Mm -hmm. It's just lower maintenance over time. However, there's some really good deck builders in our area, like Dr. Dex, who make a good living doing really cool deck details. Right. The last two, last year, I think we've done three decks. That's the detail. Yeah. That's the detail, because it's the same thing. I just want to use what's already on the job site. If I buy a bucket of those screws, I want to use them for everything possible. Yep. The simpler things can be, the better for everybody. I, I woke up this morning to a nightmare that we had concrete coming but I had forgotten to confirm with the uh, flat work guy. But, so I woke up going, I have to call Sebastian. Do you think he can come? Then I realized it's a nightmare. So I, I think about all the moving parts and how nobody sleeps the night before. Maybe cranes come or concrete trucks come. So the simpler we can make it, the better it is for everybody. Details that somebody's taking the time. Here's a fastener, you're already using it. If you're gonna use straps, and we know everybody uses the wrong nail gun for the strap, can we make a strap that the, marries the two? Right. So. Yeah, as far as decks, we're, we're all in on the fasteners. We use these screws to attach all of our bracing now, temp bracing. I don't want guys yanking with pry bars. You know, over time, it messes with your elbows. Just grab an impact driver and a screw. They go back in the bucket. Foundation work, we use those screws to attach all of our forms and bracing. This last time, we always pour in lifts, and we went right to the top, no creaking, and I was like, and instead of driving duplex nails, it screws. You turn on your music, it's just... I, I feel like we're at that tipping point where people didn't go into the trade. Like I was told when I was growing up, look at all of the carpenters, they all have bad backs. Right. So I went to school for some accounting. I was like, this is not my thing. I want to be on the job site. But we wanted to be smart. So use heavy equipment for heavy objects. Right. For repetitive tasks, use tools. Use the lowest impact tool. Can we eliminate ladder work? Not always, but where we can, let's eliminate it. Threaded rod and, and some of the different connectors, I, don't, I somehow always strip everything out. So if I can use screws and attach, even better. Even if we have to add some, the deck we're building, what is it, it's the little, what's the smaller version, the DT1Z? Yep, the, the GTT1Z. We was you, close. They're, they're around, That's so close. Yeah, you're right there, they're, they're around the corner We can just here. add more, you know, and just make life easier. So. Where I see things, I, I'm sure it's the true with you guys, we cannot find people that want to come and work. Our, a guy that used to work with us teaches at the local trade school. We're like, hey, Eric, can you put flyers up? You know, we'd love the summer help. Not one person. So we're at that point where we have to make decisions. We don't have enough labor. We have labor that's too expensive, quite frankly, because it's scarce. So what can we do that lowers labor hours? What can we do that's easier to teach? Now Washington State, we, it's finally through the lawsuits, continuous insulation. Well, the product we use, Huber Zip R Sheathing, will that give us the shear value? Yes. But if we have more windows, then do we need some additional? Right. So there's this marrying between engineering, building science, trying to make buildings more comfortable, last longer. No one of those things is separate now. Everybody has to work together. Right. Uh, we're, air sealing details as framers, we never had to do that kind of stuff. Right. But if it's easier to lay something on the top plates than lay, lay trusses so that later that can be taped to the lid, that's on our scope of work now. Right. So it is not just that people who weren't smart enough to go to college became framers. 
<laughs> it's people who are smart enough to go to college and just want to get into construction. Right. We no, need their brains. Yeah, you're, you're seeing that often. And we've, we've alluded to it a couple of times already and standardization of the way we do things. And But the one thing that's always stuck with me for all the years I've been in, in this is you're, something's still going to go wrong, right? You can cover everything on the side and something's going to be... How many of you guys have ever had everything go perfect on one of your jobs? Every single thing? Awesome. We, we need it. We need to hire this guy. It's a, yes. Right. As he holds a beer. Nice. <laughs> right. And and so, you need to already have something as that backup, right? You know, this went wrong. Whether it's inspector catching it or your own people catching it. Like one of the things that I see it a lot is wall anchorage. How are you guys attaching your walls to your foundation? Everybody see this? Everybody know what that is? Titan HD. T the Titan HD. What does code call for, for for wall attachment to the foundation? Half inch diameter elbow, right? Seven inches of bevin into masonry or concrete with a nut and washer. It's the least expensive way to do it. So many people now, because not there's not a job site that has them all perfect. You're gonna have a couple out of place, you're gonna have one where you don't need it, and you're not gonna have a couple where you do need them. So they're, all, they're already drilling and putting something else in place, right? We've seen with a lot of guys, they did a time and cost study, and they say, we want a clean slab, no bolts, we'll drill and put these in yeah. through the entire project. And Nothing to trip on, the impalement hazard goes away. Like, it's not just that foundation guy lays out bolts or the framer comes by, and then we realize we made some mistakes, we pour concrete around it, we have to sometimes try to set walls over bolts, but we can only drill them a 16th bigger. Almost everybody oversizes the hole because it makes our life easier. So we can eliminate all of that and come in and do this after the fact. And what I like about it is, if I just want mindless work, I'll do this. Right. Put the headphones on, protect my hearing and go for it. Or it's the summer intern or the person that you're trying to teach how to use their tools safely. They almost can't do it wrong. Same size bit as the, as the anchor. You can tell them how far to drill turn them loose. So the installed cost goes down because it's not your foreman doing it, right? That's right? It might be the person with three weeks experience. Right. And by the time they put a hundred of these, they're now as much of an expert as I am. Right. You know, so that's, it's just a lot easier. They're not cheaper, but if you buy them in bulk, buy them online, buy them in the dealer. If you have a number of jobs, don't buy two boxes at a time. That's one thing my dad, because his background is accounting, is you just try to save money and time everywhere and little amounts add up. Like the Hyperlite um, hikers, yeah. you're saving an ounce at a time and it adds up, right? right? So buy them online, find a way to buy them um, in bulk and a portion amount to the jobs, get that cost down. And then once you've done it, you're like, I wanna go back to the other way. Right, yeah, and, and time is everything. And that's what, you know, we were talking earlier with the quick stick and it's the same here. It's, it's time spent, right? With that, you gotta go up the ladder and nail off and then come down and move the ladder and. Or I can stay on the ground and run screws. No, it's you just same. lean to get three more. To get, uh, yeah, and totally then, safe. And it's then okay. somebody eventually falls. <laughs> the, the, the same thing with these bolts. I think they really help uh, that that time savings. You're right. They're a little more expensive than an anchor bolt, but you don't have to drill the plate now, or you're drilling the plate at the same time you're making the hole. Right? You don't have to pre-drill it ahead of time and try and stand it up over the bolt with an oversized hole. It's just, yeah. I'm, it's the fun part. I, I've been here a long time, but I, in my younger days in youth and school, did a lot of framing of decks and houses and all these things that we, I now know you're not supposed to do. Shame to say I did it, from notched guard posts to yep. over drilling holes yep. and everything. So I too learned by doing, doing it wrong. wrong. <laughs> and we'll run through that. Um, we've got, I think we've got a couple minutes left here and we'll take some questions from the audience then. But, um, let's say, and we asked this earlier that another group, Let's say somebody's up here looking to get into the industry. They have a great time. JLC is an awesome show. They're talking with a lot of people. And Monday morning, they, they wake up and decide they're gone to become a framer. What advice would you give them? You know, if they, they, they need to find a good crew. And I would say, I get asked that quite a bit. And I never have a good answer until right now. All right. <laughs> Call the lumber yard and ask them who has a good reputation. Who are, because they know people are pulling in and out. You know, I see the same people pulling in and out every day ask them, ask the local building inspector, because you want to go to work for a good crew, somebody that's interested in doing it right. Come to the shows, read everything. This is probably T TMI, 
we used to leave the catalogs in the Santa can. If somebody had time, at least they were reading something they were going to learn. And I'm not kidding about that. Learn, learn, learn. And now we can learn mostly through social media. It's not just reading JLC and fine home building, but it, it's getting online. Build show, fine home building is great. JLC is great. The presenters here, go find them, meet them, you know, talk to them, and then follow them on their social media accounts. Who would have ever thought, like in the old MySpace days, and early Facebook that Instagram would become this thing where we could actually learn how to do things the right way. And then the whole, all of us kind of uh, preaching the same message, we're all getting better. No, I, I think that's that's great. And, and I'm a testament to it too, because in a couple of years back, anybody had the washing machine break at the house? Well, ours quit working. And you know what my wife said? Hey, let's go to the store and buy a new washing machine. And I went, that's not the way I'm wired. I'm like, hold on a minute. And I took the back cover off of it and, I, and then I stopped. And I said, there's gotta be a video of exact, and you know, in five minutes I had the thing apart and the part ordered online and showed up the next day and it's back together. I was out 12 bucks instead of 800 for a new washing machine. So you're right there. Simpson's got a lot of resources on our website. We have a build a learning center, lots of classes. And, and you get continuing education credits for some of that, right? You can get yeah. continuing education credits for a lot of our classes. So some of you that have to be licensed in the States, um, that's available there, all free of charge. Our YouTube channel has a lot of videos because some of our stuff's not easy to install and you get the videos and stuff for it. So let's take some questions from the audience. Who's got, who's got a question? All right, here I'm gonna come to you with the mic. I'm just uh, curious, uh, how do you guys uh, do, I know you guys do these events and stuff like that, but how are you guys teaching the, the, the local inspectors how to, what's acceptable nowadays? Because I, I run into that problem a lot where, oh, you sure you can use that screw instead of a hurricane clip? I have to bring out a book, or I have to call an engineer, or something like that. But how can we eliminate that process, or at least make it less um, steps yeah. to get the approval? That, that may be a question for me, but I don't know if you have a. Yeah, I don't know if you have a comment. Well, I know, on, like on our, our local reps. Detail. Yeah, because we had um, the same inspector that wasn't going to let us use Titans. I mean, he was really. We haven't built that municipality for a while. He was really going to establish our relationship, and I was like. I'm just gonna pretend like I'm just the inquisitive idiot. What's the best way for me to get Titans approved? Well, they won't be. What's the best way for me to get Titans approved? Because they're approved in the neighboring county, I have an engineer's letter. And so I called Norm, our local Simpson rep, and he's like, and he's a little frustrated because he's like, I'm down there teaching them. So the reps really take the bull by the horn and they put on little classes, a lot of times for the code officials, to say, hey, we've got this new fastener, here's the loads. That way they know it's coming. I think because of social media, sometimes it makes it into the field a little quicker than that right. process. So I, that, that, and I can call Norm and say, hey, Kitsap's giving us a little bit of trouble. Do you mind sending them an email or a site visit? And, and great point, though, saying you've got to act like you're the, you don't know. But that's, you know, trying to get approved. Some of those guys are yeah, that, that, up here. Yeah, that, that's correct. And the, and the other thing, and, and Tim's right, the Simpson reps are out in the field and we, we, a lot of our guys are, are chapter members of local code officials associations so that we can present and show them and you know it's what we want to go. We're going to say, hey, I was just visiting with Tim. This is the product he really wants to use. Here's the code approval for it. Here's the spacing tables. Here's everything. And I wanted to give you guys a heads up that people are going to start asking for that. That's in an ideal world. That's how it works. You know, we show you, you go, yes, I want to use that product. And I go, great. Give me a day to get over here. And but sometimes the process breaks down, but we're out telling them. Uh, the, the real, the best advice I can give you on that, and my card's over here, you can be sure and take one of them, but you need to know your local rep. You know, he mentioned Norm. If he call, Norm probably knows the code official yeah. on a first name basis, and he can call Norm, and, and sometimes, you know, they're gonna come, people call me and stuff the same way. Sometimes they're gonna call me and I go, yeah, the code official's right on that one. You need to <laughs> add this to it, right? And other times it'll be like, let me call them, no problem. And it runs through that way. So get to know your Simpson rep in those cases. Or if it were, you know, you mentioned Huber and their, their insulated, you know, zip panels. If it's something like that that's newer, get to know that rep. And the, yeah. the more you know from the manufacturer's reps, the more they'll be able to help you. And introduce those reps. Like social networking. Right. It turns out we all need to be networking. Multiple manufacturers, companies, code officials, invite them. Um, we have a pretty good relationship with ours. I think a lot of them get the newsletter. You can sign up for all this. What I, what I find for me personally, and my brother too, if we've taken the time to understand and know, 
then they know they're having a conversation with somebody that's not trying to cut corners. But when I explain to him why we, because he's like, why do you want to go to those? Oh, here's what I save. Here's what the benefits have been. I would, I would love if every code official had to work with us for six months and every engineer worked with us for six months and then we rode along with them as they did inspections for six months, we would all understand each other better, right? T totally would. Any other, who's got another question? Come on, JP. <laughs> you got, here, I'm going to come to you with the microphone. I, ju I just want to add, we've been around for over 40 years. Um, social media is not always the answer for your answers. You got to know who is presenting the information. Yes. Do your homework. It may sound easy and better than what you're doing, but go back to the people that really know what they're doing, the manufacturers, and make sure that's what they want you to do. That... And then have that information yes. when the, the inspector shows up. You have that information in your hand where you got what you did, and they learn from you. When you say, I just want to share. I, this is how I learned it could be a better place for all of us. And they will go home and check. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes they call you afterwards and ask you, you know, like a personal information. I don't know, but I think you know. Where did you get that information yeah. so I can check out another job? Yeah, that, that is an excellent point because we're in the age of misinformation, right? Doesn't matter what it is. Healthcare matters, politics, framing, hardware, engineering. Just because that person with a big following says something does not mean they have a clue what they're talking about. So if they're not posting the references, they probably don't really know. They're repeating something and they have to be very skeptical. I know that most people though on Instagram, like people that I would think would never respond to me because they have such a big following, they'll respond to DMs. Yeah, so you could DM them and say, hey, where was that? And we'll find it for you. That's like, that's like good customer service, right? I think it's a fantastic point. And the, the thing I'll add to it is a lot of times, check for a second source and see, you know, if you start to see it multiple times, look, I, I get into a lot of building code discussions. I sit on a couple code committees and, and we always talk about the intent of the code. And you're going to read something yeah. and you're going to interpret it one way. I'm going to read something and we're going to find a third person and we're all three going to interpret it slightly different, right? And and the, the true intent's probably somewhere in the middle of all of that. And so getting multiple sources looking at it, especially going back to a manufacturer and seeing if they have content out on it, um, it is that app proof you need and then have it with you, like you said. It's great. Yeah, that's a good point. Very good point. Any others? I think we can take take one more and then we'll, we'll let you guys visit here some. I'm just wondering how this Titan works. I've okay. Never seen it. The Titan hold it. Okay, great. I love this. See, this is good that we brought this up. He was asking about how the Titan HD works. So that's a concrete screw. What we see a lot of guys doing is, right, they're gonna take the walls and they're gonna stand them up. So they're gonna frame your walls on the ground, you're gonna stand them up, you're gonna brace them, you can plumb them. Guys will shoot a few pins in sometimes just to keep them yep. squared. And then now, instead of having the bolts that were put into the concrete ahead of time, they're gonna come back with a hammer drill and they're gonna drill a hole, a half inch diameter hole, right through the bottom plate and right into the concrete. And they're gonna install that half by six bolt, right, it would come right behind it with an impact and drive it right in. Oxy. Right into the foundation. Nothing. You drill a, that's a half inch diameter bolt. You drill a half inch diameter hole that's about five inches deep into the concrete. So you go through the plate and, and five inches or so into the concrete. And then you pull the, the drill bit out and you take that one and run it right behind it. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is drill it a little deeper so the dust settles. Yeah. Because with silica requirements, we don't want to be putting dust out there. That's just one more thing to deal with. No special inspection needed. It's stamped on the head. Yeah, don't have to deal with epoxy. Yeah, no, no, none needed. And if, and if you're in an area that uses 5 8 diameter anchor bolts, you just use a 5 8 diameter one of these. It's, it's literally a one to one replacement. They're having they're, way they're, too they're much fun. They're having a lot of fun. You guys are at the wrong booth, I think. Right? And it, to, to add on to that point about having your information ready, you know, if a code official hasn't seen that, there's a nice technical bulletin we have that references the evaluation report and the spacing tables and the section of the codes and how it works. So you hand that over right to them and it works from there. The best thing is to get it on the plans. Yes. Because that's already stamped. If the inspector comes out and says, well, I don't know about these, it's on the plans. Right. So. Thank you guys. Tim, thank you for your time. Thank you guys for here. We'll, we'll turn the mics off and let you guys come up. I'm sure you, some of you want questions or social media posts and stuff with it. So thank you guys. Nice job. Good work. Get this guy.
We don't want any hot, hot mics in the... No. Had a guy wear one to the restroom one yes. time. We've all seen that, <laughs> you got it? You got that it? movie clip. <laughs> nice to meet you. My name's Micah. Nice to meet you, Micah. I uh, watch your videos all the time, my friend. That's what they're there for. Thank you, yeah, Chris. Great job. Uh, I, in fact, uh, at work, I always say, this is what Tim says we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, her, her point was, we need to make a note of that because you can't, what makes me, how do I know? Or how do you know that I know? Well, you look like a pretty trustworthy guy. Well, that's gotten a lot of people into trouble. <laughs> right now we're dealing with um, issues in Boeing, right? With the whole... That wasn't recording is all I got to say. Because <laughs> you're getting me in trouble. Right here. Hey, Cam, is Mercedes. <coughs> Are you all speeding? Speeding? Okay. Hey, on the bill show! <laughs> you been standing there waiting for that. <laughs> All right, so JLC Live, amazing show. What'd y'all think, guys? Pretty great. Not bad, not bad? So an even better show, Build Show Live, building on the success of this show. We got a bunch of contributors that are gonna be there. We're gonna be teaching a bunch of stuff. For instance, Jake, you're teaching a class called the Four Control Layers. Yeah. What is that? Well, if you're gonna build a building and you have a goal for that, you, you wanna create an indoor environment, you have to gain control over your environment. Yep. So you have to be managing for water, you have to be managing for air leakage, you have to be dealing with insulation, the, the thermal movement through the building, and then we might be concerned about vapor a little. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about like how my company finds success, a lot of the stuff that we do with Steve Basic, yep. and uh, all these methods that we've developed over the years. And I'm gonna put up a ton of pictures and we're gonna, we're gonna look at pictures of silicone and things like that and go, this thing works, this thing doesn't. This is how you gain control over your building. I would go to Build Show Live just to see that presentation if nothing else. This is the kind of stuff that you're gonna see at Build Show Live. However, Steve and I, what are we doing, Steve? Matt, we have a one full day pre-show Building Science. Now you might have seen Building Science 101, Build Science 201. We're bringing 301 live. It's going to be incredible. A full day of training with Steve and I. And by the way, we're some we're going to be going to some of my job sites in my personal house for tours, including a house under construction that I'm building actually up the street from my house. We've got a lot of good stuff planned. These guys are going to be there. You want to be there as well. But that being said, JLC Live 2024, that's a wrap. Hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday. Follow us on Facebook or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on The Build Show. Nice, guys.